Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Yuval Levin. I'm Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies here at AI. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this conversation with my colleague Ian Rowe about his very important new book, Agency. Um, Ian is a senior fellow here at AI. The work he does here focuses particularly on education and on upward mobility, on family formation, opportunity, exactly the subjects that he takes up in this new book, um, he's also co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, which is a new uh, network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools that are opening in the Bronx this coming year. Uh, Ian's had an extraordinary career. He was for a long time the CEO of Public Prep, uh, a nonprofit network of public charter schools that started in the Bronx. Uh, before that, he worked at the Gates Foundation. He was a vice president at MTV when that was a thing. Um, <laughs> yes. And, still uh, relevant. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and and uh, was a, uh, a high-ranking official at the Freedom Corps office at the White House. Um, and so from a variety of angles, he's looked at the questions we're going to talk about today. All of that work, I think, in different ways revolved around the same set of concerns, which is basically the question of how to enable every young American, and especially those who start out in, in, in circumstances of disadvantage, to rise, to succeed, to build a flourishing life in our country. This new book offers, in a sense, a kind of vision that I think of as having emerged from those long years of experience in, in, in contending with that challenge, with that question. And it packs just a huge amount of wisdom, both theoretical wisdom and especially practical wisdom, about how to think about that question, how to approach that question. There's a lot of theorizing around that set of issues, but what's distinct about Ian is that he goes out and does it over and over. He doesn't just talk about how things could be done, but he starts a school, he gets engaged in his community, he's just run for school board uh, yes. because somebody has to, and, <laughs> uh, and won and is on the school board in his local community. Um, and it's that sense that it's not enough to think about how, it's also essential to do it, to get engaged. Uh, that I think really helps his work stand out and helps him both know more about the theory than pure theoreticians do and know a lot more about the real world and how it works. This book packs a lot of knowledge and insight on those questions into what is really also a very accessible, very readable package. I recommend it to you very highly. It's a book that gives us a lot to think about, a lot to talk about, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to think about it and talk about it. Our format could not be more simple. Ian and I are going to talk about the book. Um, and after that, we'll open things up to questions, both from people here in the room and from those of you who are watching us online. If you are watching online, there are two ways that you can ask a question. You can email it to Peyton Roth at AI.org, and that address is on your screen if you're watching us online now. Or you can use Twitter with the hashtag AgencyAI. And you can do that at any point in the conversation. We will gather up those questions and put them to Ian at the end. Um, I also want to note that this uh, conversation for us is part of a series at AI that we call the Edward and Helen Heinz Book Forums, and we're enormously grateful to Edward and Helen Heinz uh, for being great friends of AI for a long time in general, but also especially for investing particularly in this kind of intellectual engagement around important new books, which is very important for us and which they make possible for us. With that, Ian, I think we should just jump in. And really, the way to jump in, I think, might just be for you to tell us a little bit about what moved you to, to write this book. How did you find yourself in a place where this was what you thought you needed to do? And in that sense, what it is you're trying to convey? Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Yuval. It's a great honor to be here uh, with you. When you were just talking about uh, practitioner and doing things, I, I, I just saw the film uh, Top Gun, uh, Maverick. I don't know if everyone's seen it. But there's this incredible scene where you know, there's this impossible mission that has to be run, and the team doesn't think that they could do it. And Tom Cruise literally gets into a plane and flies this impossible but achievable mission, and he shows that it can be done. And I, I was just very inspired by that scene, because I, I actually do like to think of myself, and I hope to inspire others, it's not enough just to have an idea. You actually do have to show how this idea lives in reality with real people. Um, the reason I run schools is that I, I want young people to know that they can do hard things, that there will be challenges that you face in your life, but there are methodologies of 
millions and millions of people who are from the same exact situation that you are in and yet have managed to be successful. Why? What are those ingredients of human flourishing? And uh, I'll share a quick story that really brought me into a lot of this. Um, so I, I was running a, um, a network of uh, public charter schools. I started in 2010, public prep. And we were having great success. We had about 2,000 students in our schools, nearly 5,000 on the wait list. Um, you know, it's a crushing thing to be able to accept a couple hundred kids every year and then have to tell 5,000 families the best we can do is put your child on a really long wait list. And our, our headquarters were in uh, Tribeca, very she-she on West Broadway. You know, you could get a latte on the corner and, you know, lead a nice life. But I said, you know, in the South Bronx, the, the level of access to high-quality education was just very low. Uh, only 2% of kids that start ninth grade four years later graduate from high school ready for college in certain districts. This was in District 8. And that's craziness, you know? And so we had great demand. So we decided to move our headquarters from uh, Tribeca to 149th Street and 3rd Avenue in the South Bronx. And, you know, it's a, somewhat of a high crime area. There was a needle exchange on the corner. And our team, I wanted the team to get acclimated to this new neighborhood. Because even though this was a tough neighborhood, kids were there. And these kids deserve a great education. And this, we should have a, our headquarters there as well. And um, so we went on a walking tour of the neighborhood. And in the distance, all of us, we see a 27-foot baby blue Winnebago truck uh, with, with adults standing around it, very excited. Um, almost like when you see an ice cream truck with young people that are excited to see it. And as we got closer, we saw that the truck said, who's your daddy? And just, what is that? And it turns out the who's your daddy truck was a mobile DNA testing center where low-income folks were spending somewhere between $350 to $500 to answer questions like, could you be my sister? Are you my father? Very profound questions about identity. And even though, obviously, I'd run schools in the heart of the South Bronx and knew that our kids were in sometimes tough family structures. Just the normalcy of that just struck me in a whole new way. And I realized my schools were necessary but not sufficient. And I started doing research. I discovered that the non-marital birth rate in this particular area of the Bronx was 85%. I discovered that these numbers, I can go to Chicago, Dallas, Appalachia, many parts of the country, and this was a common theme. And yet we as educators didn't really talk about it. And I decided, well, what if we start teaching kids about this element of their future lives? Timing of family formation, I started doing research, and I discovered this thing called the success sequence. You know, I discovered this data that says if you finish your, just your high school degree, get a full-time job, and if you have children, marriage first, 97% of the people who follow that series of decisions avoid poverty. Wow, it's not 100% because there's no guarantees in life. And so we decided to start trying to teach that in our eighth grade classrooms. Massive opposition. Massive opposition. From, from gatekeepers who said, no, 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 you can't teach this to these kids. It, you'll be insulting them. That, you know, they're, you'll, uh, you know, their parents didn't follow the success sequence in their own lives. Better not to focus on that. Let's focus on the real issues of systemic racism and institutional barriers. Let's just deprive them. And it was the first time, like, wait a minute. We, this is information. Don't we think this is crucial and important? And so we asked the eighth grade parents what they thought. Because we said, you've chosen our school. You entered the lottery because you want us not only to teach you math and science and reading, teach your kids that, but also the habits will, that will give them the greatest likelihood of success. And so we're going to teach, not in a prescriptive way, but here's information that we think could be helpful about the series of decisions that your children will face. Education, work, marriage, and children, 97% avoidance of poverty. The reaction we got back from the parents, most of whom did not follow this series of questions, was, thank God someone is teaching me these things, because I wish Someone had taught me these things when I was much younger. And it was one of the first times I realized we have to have the courage to say obvious things. 
there's information that we know about what typically <clears throat> leads to human flourishing for kids. And there are a lot of gatekeepers that seem to be standing in the way of that information. And I think we've got to break mm -hmm. that stranglehold. So you, you, you start that approach in the book with this concept of agency, yes. um, a, a concept that I think maybe we, we all think we understand, we have a definition of, but you offer a distinct definition of, of agency in the book. You call it the force of one's free will guided by moral discernment. Um, why is that what agency means? And why is that guided by really necessary for agency? Isn't yeah. it just independence? Well, it's not just independence. And I, and I think it, it, it's important to reflect on this point that no one is truly independent. No one is truly on their own. You are a function of the environments and the institutions that have formed you. And, um, you know, and thank you very much for writing the forward uh, for agency because your book, A Time to Build, is very much about this idea of the criticality of institutions, of helping form our ability to become independent. One of the things I set up in agency, these two what I call meta-narratives that I think uh, is really impeding the ability of young people right now to have a sense of agency, and I'll give more explanation to my definition, but I call these two meta-narratives blame the system and the other is blame the victim. In blame the system, that's an ideology that if you're not succeeding in America, it's because America itself is at fault. It's an oppressive nation. Based on your race, your gender, some other superficial characteristic, you're either the oppressed or you're an oppressor. You're just locked into one of those roles. Capitalism itself is evil. There's a white supremacist lurking on every corner. That these systems are so rigged against you, you have no power other than waiting for some massive government intervention to come in to solve your problem. But on the flip side is what I call blame the victim. And there, if you're not successful, it's not because of America is not the problem. America is great. You're the problem. You have some pathology. You have not pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. You're the architect of your own failure. Both of these narratives, in my view, add up to a singular lie that is robbing young people of the ability to believe that they can lead a self-determined life. I've been doing um, a tour on college campuses and, I, and I've, I've set up this framework and one, one law student in this big amphitheater raised his hand. He said, well, if I can't blame the victim and I can't blame the system, then who do I blame? And it was very interesting because this young person in law school, very talented, he's looking for a culprit. Right? He's looking for, he's obsessed, he needs an explanation for what's wrong with America as opposed to understanding the institutions that make America work. And so that's why I feel like this framework of agency is so important to help young people understand that they do have the capacity to overcome institutional barriers that the blame the system advocates say are insurmountable while also acknowledging that there are institutions that are critical to your development that blame the victim advocates constantly ignore. So agency, yes, it's the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. The force of your free will guided by moral discernment. So think of agency as a vector, like velocity. Velocity is not just speed, it's speed and direction. So if each one of us has the ability to make decisions in our own life, how do you learn to become morally discerning? How do I know what is right versus wrong? And that is why I've written the book and created a framework I call free, family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship, as the four pillars that I think more young people need to embrace in their own lives to be able to lead a life of flourishing. The, that, that framework that you come to at the end is really a crucial part, I think, of the teaching of the book. And I want to think about each of those, but in a way, entrepreneurship stands out as a little different. It's easy to see how family and religion and education, uh, maybe it's not easy, we'll talk about them, but entrepreneurship doesn't seem like it's in the same category. What, what do you mean by entrepreneurship? Yeah. So entrepreneurship, it is interesting because um, in many ways, entrepreneurship, the last E in free, is a byproduct 
of having strong family, strong faith commitment, and strong education driven by school choice. Because in many ways, those are the foundations upon which you now as a young person can have a sense to be a bit more adventurous, to take risks, to lean into life, right? Because an entrepreneurship is, you know, most people when they think of entrepreneurship, they think of starting your own business. It certainly includes that. But it's also about this idea of having ownership, that you can take risks, that you can engage. I mean, so many young people today, in my view, and you've written about this, are checking out of life. They're on video games. They're not engaging in real relationships. Now you've got, you know, um, you know virtual reality and other all sorts of escapist um, uh, 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 exercises, and young people are not engaging. And so I view entrepreneurship as a sense of ownership of your own life. It, it clearly includes work and getting involved, but it also includes this idea of how do I create my own larger destiny? In the schools that I, we're um, launching um, in August, one of the things we're doing, partnering with Charles Schwab through a, what they call their Stock Slices program, where for $5 you can own a share of Walmart or Apple or Google, every student will have a portfolio of 10 S&P 500 stocks. So uh, every quarter, you, some students will get earnings, some other dividends. But the, the idea is that if you, like if you have an iPhone, you're not just a consumer, you're an owner. What does that mean? How did this, how did this little thing come to be? And I think that part of the way that we help young people get to the point where they can think about building their own enterprises is that there's got to be a moral formation. So it's almost like the F and family, R and E, almost lead to your ability to become an entrepreneur. Hmm. Well, one of the really striking concepts in that chapter on entrepreneurship is the, this idea of earned success, yeah. um, which, isn't this, which isn't simply success, and it also isn't simply good intentions and motive. It isn't just the earned or just the success. How do you think about earned success? What does that mean in practice? Yeah, I think uh, fundamentally it's this idea of reciprocity. Mm. So often, and I find this in schools all the time, that we aren't asking things in return of students. There's a, there's a school system, a San Diego um, school system last year made a decision uh, in order to achieve their version of racial equity, they made the assumption that uh, you know black kids who had a higher failure rates, you know, we can't really expect them to get their homework handed in on time, right? So what they did was they made a decision to eliminate that requirement for all kids. That you know, you know, so the kids are like, this is great, <laughs> right? But as a, as someone who runs schools, actually homework is a really really important task that you've got to do. You've got to study, the responsibility of doing your best work, having it graded, check for, checks for understanding. And yet in so many areas, you know, in Oregon, the governor just passed a law a few months ago that you no longer have to demonstrate proficiency in math and reading in order to be able to graduate from high school. That's not earned success. That is, that is a false sense of achievement. And I think and again, a lot of it actually comes out of this blame the system ideology. Well, you know, we can't expect these kids. They're, it's, it's really, um, these systems are rigged against them. So essentially, let's lower standards in order to give a leg up, when in fact, what you're actually doing is depriving this opportunity for earned success. When you remove the expectation, when you remove standard, that does more damage to young people and, in my view, kills an entrepreneurial spirit because you never have confidence that what you've actually done, you've earned your way in. The, the, the free framework starts with F, with family. And when you talk about family, I have to say I had, a, I had a sort of image of my grandmother because from the moment I became an adult, every conversation with her would start with, when are you getting married? <laughs> um, and in a sense, there's a way that your chapter works that way. I, 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 I want you to talk a little bit about that, but also how is this received? When you speak to people about the importance of marriage um, in, in this cultural moment and in various kinds of communities and parts of our society, how do people react to that message? It's a powerful question. I mean, it depends on who the audience is. When I speak to uh, 
the so-called gatekeepers, the elites, the ones who say you can't teach about marriage. You know, that's imposing middle class values on low income kids. The first thing you realize is that for many of the gatekeepers who are saying you shouldn't teach this to disadvantaged kids, for example, they have exercised the success sequence in their own lives, right? They are, they are actively not preaching what they practice in their own lives. That's the first thing you realize that, in my view, it's very hypocritical, that there is a body of knowledge of what we already know, and family formation is central as the first forming mediating institution that develops the morals and characters for kids. And so, um, so when I talk about marriage, that community is very resistant. But when I speak to people in communities, let me share a story. When I visited um, was in developing uh, Vertex Partnership Academies, this high school we're launching, we visited great high schools across the country. I visited a, a school in New Orleans, a group of ninth graders, almost all low-income kids. And I said to them, you know, we're designing this high school in New York, and there's some topics we want to teach about. And I said, so for example, if you knew that there were a series of decisions in your control that uh, for people like you who followed them, 97% avoid poverty, would you want to know more about that series of decisions? And they looked at me and said, of course we'd want to know. Why wouldn't we want to know that? And I said, well, there are some grown-ups who think you shouldn't know that that somehow you'll be insulted or somehow, somehow it, it, it'll hurt your, your own sense of possibility. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Why would you hold that information from me? Actually, one of the techniques I learned at MTV, if you want to reach young people, frame something as someone else is trying to keep it from you. That is exactly <laughs> the strategy to use to get young people to get on board. And so we then proceeded to have a discussion about the series of decisions related to the success sequence. And it wasn't like this, you must do this, but at the end of the conversation, when we talked about all these different scenarios and what the likelihood of success is, because again, nothing's a guarantee, what I found was that these students felt that someone respected them as future decision makers in their own life. And so, to me, we have to ignore the gatekeepers mm -hmm who seem to always claim that they know what's best for certain communities, but they don't represent those interests. And honestly, if, I, if there's any message I want to, you have to have the courage to say obvious things. When you hear people like these saying, no, 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 that stuff doesn't matter, it's only about the institutional barriers, or that these kids, that, you know, they dug their own ditches, it's just not true. There's always some element of personal responsibility, for sure. There are charter caps. There are some structural barriers. So it's not that those things don't exist. But to the degree that that's where you lead the conversation about what the sense of possibility is for young people, that's a false standard. And we have to have the courage, courage to challenge it. So if, if marriage is hard to talk about, religion has got to be even <laughs> harder to talk about, right? It's not even in the success sequence. You introduce it as a key part of what it takes, but it's, it's not often talked about that way. And, and you take it up in a way that's very engaging and I think is very important to think through. How, how is religion part of this story? Yeah. So um, when I first discovered the research around the success sequence, it, it was powerful. I mean, what... Other, what, what any, what, is there any policy initiative that gets the kind of results where you can say doing this 97% of the time avoids poverty, right? So it's, it's very satisfying. It's very numerical. Um, it's an economic framework. But over time, I realized, and, I'll, and I shared this with Brad Wilcox and, and Isabel Sahel, others who have who've been a lot of the drivers behind the research here, it doesn't have a moral dimension that it really explains that you won't be in poverty, but there are other aspects of human flourishing that are really important, that we also want young people to be aware of. The beauty of marriage, the strength that comes from a faith commitment. I mean, look at the levels of social isolation, alienation, depression that exists amongst many young people today. 
So yes, having an economic framework is helpful, but not knowing the power of having a faith commitment, in my view, deprives young people of one of the very sources of incredible strength. Because if you look at the data, young people that who do have a personal faith commitment, much lower levels of alienation and loneliness, depression. They're part of communities that love them and care for them. This is really important. So I deliberately, when I started writing agency, it was all about the success sequence. Literally, that's, it was, and, but in writing it, I just felt that there was a dimension that I would be doing a disservice mm -hmm. if I didn't talk to young people. And by the way, the category of nuns, N-O-N-E-S, that's one of the highest, you know, no religious affiliation, that's one of the highest categories growing amongst young people. We gotta bring that back. Because um, I, I, I think it can help, even in these terrible stories that we're hearing about mass shootings, and it's, it's very hard to tie any specific incident, but as a culture, if more young people had a sense of this idea of forming a strong family, the power of a strong faith commitment, maybe, just maybe, those would be the kinds of forces that not only reduce the levels of alienation, but hopefully in some way reduce some of these horrific uh, incidents that we're mm -hmm. seeing. E education, the third of these, is where you've spent a lot of your life. Um, and I wonder if beyond the, the, the straightforward fact that people need skills and people need to know what the economy requires, if you could help us think through how you see the, the, the place of the school um, and the role of education in giving people an opportunity. And maybe tell us a little bit about the, the, the new high schools that you're beginning yeah. and what it means to think about a school from scratch. What does a school really do? Yeah, and especially in this current environment, which is very dominated by these ideas of equity um, and, and DEI. And uh, we're starting a school that's grounded in the principles of equality of opportunity, individual dignity, and our common humanity. Everything is organized around the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, wisdom, and temperance. And we think that's really important because we believe the role of a school is one of the critical institutions that form the, the moral character of young people. We don't, you can't run away from that fact. In fact, if you think that you're not in the moral formation of your students, Doing nothing is actually also helping to shape the moral character of students. But you're, you're leaving a huge void where other meta-narratives can start to seep in. Narratives like blame the victim or blame the system, where you see yourself either as just a cog in this larger wheel of I'm either a victim or I'm a victimizer. You know, and that's just the way it is. And so, you know, the, the, again, the reason I run schools we have to put our virtues in action. Like again, you wrote a time to build. For me, it's not, I mean, I love being part of AEI, it's incredible, but I've gotta actually create new institutions that demonstrate the values that so much of us talk about and test the reality. Are the things that we are so sure work? Do they actually work with the communities that we believe that we're doing this for? You learn a lot. You know, when we decided to start teaching the success sequence in, in schools, there's a lot of opposition, but we learned a lot about how to speak to parents mm. first for why this is important, and then we can then approach uh, students. The other thing about the high school that we're launching, I think, is, is important, is that, you know, we hear a lot of stories now about student debt, college for all, and I used to be a college for all guy, right? But in the school that we're launching, it will be one of the first of its kind, an international baccalaureate model that at the end of your sophomore year, you will either be able to choose what's called an IB diploma pathway, which is a more traditional college or university path, or the international baccalaureate careers pathway, where you can major in computer science, architecture slash construction, media, or something in healthcare where I was sharing with you earlier, we're in early discussions with the Mayo Clinic to start a course of study in phlebotomy, where we'll have a partnership with a hospital where at the end of four years of high school, you could have an industry credential with labor market value. You could be a phlebotomist. And if you want to go into industry right away, that's your choice. I think we have to recognize that 
as opposed to ideas like let's just forgive literally trillions of dollars in, in student debt without addressing the underlying issue, maybe we actually need to create better pathways in high school that give better preparation for students who want to pursue college, sure, but also other pathways that could make sense for their own lives. So that's how we're thinking about um, education recognize our power as a formative, a formative institution, and then create new pathways for success, because it's not the same for everyone. You, you mentioned in the course of the answer the, the emphasis on equity that is so much part of our conversation now. And in the book, you, you draw a distinction between equity and equality and try to offer an idea of what equality should mean as a practical yeah. matter that I think would be very valuable. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, that. it's so interesting. In the last couple of years, somehow equity has superseded this, the basic idea of equality of opportunity. You see it in critical race theory. You see it in a lot of the anti-racist um, objectives where, if, if for, if, particularly around race, if you see a gap between races in any kind of performance, education, healthcare, then that gap must be due to a monocausal factor, racial discrimination. And if the only factor is racial discrimination in order to achieve racial equity, then we must have race-based solutions that almost force equal outcomes by racial group. And it's, it's this kind of thinking which, in my view, first of all, it's impossible unless you have some all-knowing authority which is now reallocating resources on some artificial basis based on identity group that just doesn't work. And, but in a school setting, it's not, so if this were a classroom and you're a teacher, you know, you know, there are, for every single person that's in this room, there's a different learning style. There's a different set of assets based on you as an individual, not solely based on a singular characteristic <clears throat> of your gender or your race. Um, you are who you are, and so, what we call equality of opportunity is actually this idea of differentiated instruction based on your individual strengths and areas of growth. That's what makes it possible for everyone to now have an equal playing field. That's very different than equity where you're seeking some equal outcome. And, and somehow, and again, it's this idea of equity that is driving a lot of these decisions that you see in school systems where literally in Evanston, Illinois, during uh, COVID, they opened schools for students of color, but not white students, because somehow they needed to equal the playing field. So they're literally gonna be, have an intentionally racially discriminatory practice to create some perverse <laughs> vision of equity. So I fight very hard against this idea of equity, these false ideas of anti-racism. If we really want to create a society driven by equality of opportunity, let's have strong families, strong faith commitments, strong education where we have school choice. Those are, the, those are the things we should be investing in versus these, in my view, false uh, objectives around equity. So these, these four ideas of uh, uh, this, this framework of four pieces conveniently adds up to a, uh, a, an acronym for free. Uh, I did work at MTV. It is nice <laughs> when that happens, and it's hard to do. Well done. But why free? And how do you think about freedom in a society that so often takes freedom to mean really liberation from exactly what you're describing, from family and from religion and from... Uh, and from various kinds of, uh, of impositions. You mean something else by freedom. What, what should we understand by free? Yeah, well, right. So I think sometimes we chafe at this idea that freedom actually needs constraints. Mm. You actually need boundaries to best flourish. I, I had the honor of... Uh, interviewing Shelby Steele, who's an amazing, amazing author, the other day, and he was talking about issues of race, and he said, you know, racism certainly was a problem, but today, for black people, racism is not the problem. It's actually handling the burden of freedom. How do you actually handle this responsibility that you can do whatever you want? Well, actually, being able to do whatever you want has not been the method of human flourishing. 
operating within a sense of a moral code, a set of local mediating institutions, starting with your own family, like knowing what's right and wrong, operating, starting with F, starting within family, and then having a personal faith commitment where you're operating within a set of moral strictures, this is very important. So when I mean free, I mean free not to be willy-nilly. Agency is the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. We just have to help young people know again what those institutions are that can help them become morally discerning. So freedom is not free for all, um, unabated, unrestricted freedom. Freedom is informed by the wisdom, the values, the morals that we as a collective society in human history know what is most likely to result in a life of flourishing. How do you get from this kind of set of arguments to real action and real change? One of the things you talk about in the book, for example, is the need to, for, for a kind of public awareness campaign around the success sequence uh, to help people know it. Um, and I, I think a lot of us at a place like this where most of us are not as engaged, frankly, in the practical world as you are, always wonder, you know, I wrote a book. Now the book's out there. Well, okay. <laughs> right. well, then what? Um, what is the answer to that? Then what? How do you get from ideas that might help people thrive to helping people thrive? Yeah. So um, it's not enough to just write a book. It's not enough just to write schools, you, you know, especially for young people. I remember when I was at MTV thinking critically about where are all the young places, where are all the places that young people reside, either physically or uh, social media, there we have to reach them with seven messages you know, constantly, intensely. And we need to do the same here. I mean, there, there is a Robert Doerr, who runs the American Enterprise Institute, when he was at uh, New York City, he tried to run a ad campaign about the success sequence with these very riveting ads, which said, if you do these things 97% of the time, you avoid poverty. He faced huge pushback. How could you share these things? And yet, two weeks ago, there was an ad in the New York City subway that's been hailed as being so um, responsive. Basically, it's to people who are abusing uh, fentanyl. And it says, essentially, don't be ashamed. You know, here's advice on how you should use these drugs. Start mm -hmm. slow. You know, do it with other people. I'm reading this. Like, this is what, mm -hmm. so this is the kind of message that young people are getting. So in my view, one of my hopes coming out of agency and some of, my, some of my other efforts at AEI is that we do somehow get involved in campaigns that show there are alternative ways of being that are empowering, that are much more linked to a life of flourishing. This is probably our hardest challenge, that I think more of a progressive ideology exists within general media, um, um, even news organizations that's constantly pushing these messages either of blame, more predominantly blame the system, without messaging uh, the institutions that young people can embrace. I think it's still the case that the Cosby Show, and I think this is back in the 80s, is the last show that really highlighted a 50th wedding anniversary. Mm. Like, just think about it. When was the last time you saw a show or pop that celebrated a 50th wedding anniversary. And it's this amazing episode about mm -hmm. these two people, the trials and tribulations, and how they loved each other, and how their grandchildren all celebrated the normalcy that these kids were being raised, that, wow, they were married for 50 years. They made a commitment. My parents were married for 48 years before my dad passed away. Today's my mom's birthday, by mm -hmm. the way. Um, and she's, she birthday. is very ill health, so it's, a, it's a inspiring, inspiring to be doing mm -hmm. this. But how often are kids getting these messages? So I do think it is on us to be, be bold, be courageous, take some of the social capital that we do have, and go out into communities and share this message of empowerment. And I think we're going to find many, many, many takers that are tired of a message of grievance and dependency and much more receptive 
to hope and agency. Hmm. Let me ask you a, a, a middle-aged question. Um, a where, middle-aged a question? A middle-aged question. <laughs> where do younger Americans now get their sense of what, uh, of what success looks like, of what life looks like? Where do they get the sort of core messages that the culture sends them about what they ought to be? How different is that? Is it now in, in an age of social media, of fragmented media in general? Um, how different is that than it was when you and I were growing up? Yeah. This answer might surprise you, but I think the answer is still in your most local proximate institution, mm. which is the family that you're raised in. Yes, there are certainly these other larger factors of social media and other dominant forces, but in my view, part of the reason those have become so influential is the weakening of the local institutions that heretofore had, had provided a barrier around these things. So part of the reason I spend so much time on family formation is that you know the data just came out in 2020. I'm particularly interested in uh, birth rates to women 24 and under. In 2020, the non-marital birth rate to women 24 and under who had a baby in 2020 was 72%. Mm. 62% in the white community, 92% in the black community. So it's, this is in what I call an equal opportunity tsunami. And not to say that every child that's born into a single parent home is doomed to failure. I have many, many uh, single parents in the schools I lead who would crawl through broken glass for their kids and do amazing things. Nor is it a guarantee that if you're born into a married two parent household that everything's great, right? But the data is overwhelming that your likely outcomes will be better in a married to parent household. And so when more and more kids are being born into that kind of structure that's very, in my view, unstable, then not having access to great schools, not having access to a great faith community, when you've got that now formless sense of development, now that's when this change that has shifted, that you've got social media, kids with devices or computers in their bedroom where they can close the door, suddenly they're now interacting with content that you could never even imagine would be available. So, so I think the, key, the core institutions, they, they still have the power, even in the madness, because by the way, it's happening every day. There are millions of young people who are just fine because they are being steeped in institutions that in some ways are protecting them from these notions that are now being purveyed because I think these parents have recognized that they have the first cocooning responsibility. And um, we can never lose sight of that. Well, I want to open things up for questions, so be thinking of your questions. And as you do that, I'll ask you one more thing. The, the, there's an overriding sense of hope in this book, a sense that for all the problems that exist and that are very real, the right attitude to have is a kind of dogged commitment to the possibility of success. Where does that come from and how do you sustain that sense that in a, in a, in a moment in our culture when everybody wants to tell you for different reasons why the country is going to hell, you don't seem to think it is. Yeah. I think it's because we live in America. You know, uh, de Tocqueville, in his observations of our country, said, it's not that America is more enlightened than any other nation. It's rather in her ability to repair her faults. And I have often found that a very inspiring message, because it says that we live in a good, flawed, but still great country that has the ability to improve. And I think young people need to believe that too. Not only that they believe it about their country, but that the tools of self-renewal, the tools of self-betterment also exist within you. And that you're not alone. That there are institutions that can help you form the best person that you want to be. And so we have to lead with a message of hope. I see it all the time, the debilitating narrative of when blame the system or blame the victim advocates are talking at young people, it's kind of a learned helplessness. Nicole Hannah-Jones, one of the authors of the New York Times 1619 Project, in speaking this is now to black kids, she'll say basically, 
there is nothing you can do. Doesn't matter if you get educated, doesn't matter if you buy a home, doesn't matter if you get married, doesn't matter if you save. Quote, none of those things can overcome 400 years of racialized plundering, end quote. Imagine if you're a 12-year-old kid hearing that kind of message. You start to feel, what's the point? I can't do anything. And so that type of messaging, I fight hard against that. Because I think whatever message she thinks she's sending, I believe it has the exact corrosive uh, impact. And so I think it's important that hope and agency become much more the norm versus grievance and dependency. Let's take some questions. Uh, we've got some great ones online, but we'll start here in the room and just uh, wait for a microphone. And uh, let's start right here in the middle up front. Thanks so much. I'm Christine Davies with the PolyGage Ideas Network. Um, and I have kind of a, just a short two-part question, building on Yuval's question about the calls to action those of us can take if we're not ready to go build a school or educate you know, students ourselves. Are there any networks um, that you would recommend we get involved in? Sometimes if we want to become more vocal, it's easier to do that as part of a community, just to support one another. I'd be really interested in that if we do want to yep. take that action step. And then also, it almost seems like for agency, which I'm really looking forward to reading, we almost need an inverse policy agenda, kind of a list of the ways government needs to get out of the way. Has that been a thought of something to, to provide as well? Because I'd love to... Yeah. Try to move that forward. So it's interesting. Um, so in terms of joining networks, um, I could list a, 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 a raft of national networks. But honestly, start local. Wherever you are, there are amazing people who have voluntarily come together to solve local problems. You know, I ran for school board in my own hometown. So here I am, you know, writing about critical race theory and all these other things. And yet I'm now starting to see issues in my own hometown and I felt I would be hypocritical if I didn't lean into that, too. So I did the crazy thing, and I ran, and I won. But, it's, and, and, um, but it, I feel it's the most important work I could be doing. And I'm really excited now, these next two years, to be on the board. But start local. There are amazing people who are doing wonderful work in your hometown. As far as national organizations, the Woodson Center is an amazing organization that's been around for 40-plus years that has been all about animating local leaders to solve uh, local problems. Whatever your um, idea is, if you can center around animating the local institutions, in my view, that are strengthening family, encouraging greater faith commitment, enabling school choice, and then somehow uh, stimulating more entrepreneurship, those are the levers, I think, that are most important. Uh, in terms of... Uh, <laughs> an inverse policy. Yes, I actually do want to create a, like, here's what a great policy environment would look like. In agency, I, I mean, I do have some policy initiatives, but many of the issues that we're generally talking about are more cultural and behavioral and creating new sets of social norms. That's the much tougher uh, part of the work. But we will, um, uh, we will uh, create that kind of, here's what something is good. And then also, here's some things you shouldn't do, like, what's happening in San Diego, or what was just reported earlier this week in Oak Park, um, Illinois, Oak Park, Illinois, where, uh, again, in order to achieve some kind of racial equity, they're now um, created a, a race-based grading system. At least this is what the reporting is saying, that they have to have equal outcomes by race. So now black kids are no longer penalized for not handing their homework in on time. It's just, so, the, so we'll have a list of these are things you may not want to do that are, you know, that violate the law, you know, that violate the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Let's take another question uh, in the back. Thanks, Ian. I am interested in this idea of schools as places of moral formation, and it seems like some people reject that premise entirely, as you talked about, but then there's also this momentum and call for equity in schools and justice in schools and for students to have a place of belonging in schools. And I'm curious as to whether people are expecting of schools what they might typically expect of a church. And there's also just a rise in 
the nuns and rise in secularization, is it, is it good to put these kinds of expectations on schools? Just what are we to make of this? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very fair question. I think partly due to the weakening, particularly of family and religion as the core institutions, a lot of that burden now is being placed on schools, in my view, unfairly. Um, so it's part of why this book wasn't just about family or just about religion or just about education. These, were, these are interdependent uh, institutions. Um, that said, I do think schools play a crucial role for the simple reason that not talking about character, not talking about moral formation, doesn't mean that you're still <laughs> teaching about character or moral formation. You're just teaching into a void that, by the way, is going to be filled. And so the question is, where is this void being filled by? And if it is social media or these other forces that are now much more dominant in young people's lives, then we're doing uh, a disservice. And so um, I think uh, over the last couple of years, though, with COVID, with what you know, parents had a uh, much more of a bird's eye view into what to seeing what their kids were learning. And frankly, they didn't always like what they saw. And so you've seen a, a real growth in homeschooling. You've seen a real growth in Catholic school uh, enrollment. And so I do think there's something happening where parents are recognizing that schools do play a role in moral formation and actually don't like what they have been seeing, at least in certain uh, areas, and are looking for empowering alternatives, which is why a school choice environment is so important. Let me give you one of the questions we got online. This uh, viewer says, one of the steps of the success sequence that sometimes gets glossed over, especially on the right, is full-time work. And how do you think about engaging especially more young men in meaningful work at this point? Yeah. Well, one of the ideas that I'm, I presented, described uh, with our high school is that I think there need to be more alternatives to this college for all mentality. You know, college is not for everyone. Um, and again, I used to be a college for all guy. I mean, there are lots of charter schools that have, you know, college banners up on every classroom, college, college, college. But as we can see, there are many kids that leave high school. Um, they're not equipped for the, they're not equipped for college. Um, they take on debt. They either don't earn a degree or do earn a degree that is not commensurate with the debt that, that they've taken on. And they could have been much better served by being entering in the workforce. And there's actually a lot of data that shows that um, technical education in high school actually has much better outcomes for young men in particular. <laughs> so again, for me, it's not just talking about it. I'm, I'm actually literally launching an institution that will provide this alternate pathway of equal footing. There's no stepchild relationship between taking the career path versus the diploma path. But I think I think that's something we should be looking much more aggressively at, rather than, again, trillions of dollars in you know, refunding um, higher ed debt. How about we create more pathways in high school that young men and young women uh, can have more options? Hmm. Let's take another question in the room, please, up here. Uh, Marty Danafels, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. Um, kind of an alternative narrative to the Nicole Hannah Jones as far as American history. Um, America did you know, have a Christian heritage, and in Christianity, there are what is known as the two great commandments. And one is relates to loving God, the other is love your neighbor as yourself. I would argue that that second great commandment is reflected in what the culture knows as the golden rule, which is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. So, if we can argue that that golden rule, if you will, is an outgrowth of Christianity and, and, and other faiths, I think, have other similar uh, teachings. Um, is that another way to come out, come at this resistance that you get when you, you have the R in your, in your framework? Well, certainly in the faith movement, you, you mentioned Nicole Hannah-Jones. Remember that litany of things I said that she says, it doesn't matter if you get married, educated, it doesn't matter if you save. Well, it turns out that she has done all of those things in her own life to achieve uh, economic prosperity. And so the golden rule, you know, do unto others and you like to <laughs> Maybe we should start 
preaching what we practice, for those folks who have been successful, life is not a guarantee. But when we take hypocritical positions that literally clash with what we're doing in our own lives, that I think we just have to call that out. Let's take another question in the back, please. Hi there, my name is Christine, and I am a longtime educator from Southern California, actually in the district that you spoke of in San Diego, so I'd like to comment on that. Um, and I, I'm also now an Albert Einstein Distinguished Educator Fellow in Congress. I teach pre-service teachers. Um, I am immersed in the education space, in the public education space. And I think it's really important um, to point out that... <sighs> So, so I really agree with you on a lot of things. In teaching college, I, I'm a, an astronomer. Um, I teach astronomy physics in college as well. And I think the college for all narrative is definitely something that needs uh, to be addressed. Um, that's a fallacy we feed our students. And I see that teaching college where students get there and it's just an extension of high school. Um, and they take out unnecessary debt. So I absolutely agree with you with the market-based pathways in high school. I think that's uh, something that needs to be universal. Um, something that I, I have a little bit of an issue with um, is comes down to where you talked about the false narrative of, of the equity versus equality distinction. And in public education, what we talk about in terms of differentiated instruction is actually what you talk about in terms of equality, and that kids do come in with different backgrounds. And we can't just assume they're all coming in with the same baseline. We know that's not true. Um, just like a kid looking over a fence, if, if some students can't see over the fence, how do we expect them to see what's on the other side? We have to give different supports. Um, there are also multiple locations, such as Southern California, where I'm from, where school choice, this concept of school choice, particularly during the pandemic, has proven to strip resources and served as a segregation tool in our districts where we saw the white affluent families that had the means to participate in school choice because it does take parental involvement and that's something that needs to be noted. Students don't opt in. It takes parental involvement to actually initiate a school choice option. If you don't have that parental involvement, there's no school choice option. And that has served as a huge segregating force leaving our impoverished, our black and our brown students in neighborhood districts. And to speak to this, the district you talked about, my district in San Diego, um, that was not, I just want to clarify, we did not say that only black students come to school. What we said was if you don't have broadband access and you can't do learning at home because we had huge outbreaks of COVID, we have resources for you. It was not a differentiating racial line. It was an access. And, and I just want to point that out. Um, one of, the th one of the questions I have is, um, what about these research and evidence-based solutions like community schools? And where do you see the involvement of family to initiate your, your pillars? And I really like the pillars that you're talking about, but there are some students that just that don't have that. And I hear you talking about equipping students to create a better tomorrow, and that's amazing. But what about where they are today, when they only spend eight hours a day in school and the other hours at home? What about when uh, home is not that environment? Yeah, well, there, there's uh, a lot there. So a few things. One is, um, on school choice, I'm not exactly sure the point you're making, but I agree that uh, school choice exists in our country for middle and upper class families, right? You can choose to move to a great neighborhood where there are great public schools, or you can choose to uh, send your child to a private school, a religious school, whatever you want, the school that you think makes the, the most sense for your child. Unfortunately, the vast majority of kids in disadvantaged situations don't have that. So I'm not sure if you're, I'm not sure if you're arguing against it, but yeah, I, I believe one of the ways to level the playing field is so that every parent and by the way, in New York City, there are 70,000 families on the wait list. I would never describe them as not being able to access um, school choice. Believe me, our families are desperate and searching and constantly running into barriers that impedes their ability. Because sometimes there are these folks that, yeah, you know, these folks, they wouldn't be able to make good decisions anyway. I don't, know if that, I don't think that's what you're saying, but there is this prevailing 
notion that, well, they can't really decide, so why even give them school choice in the first place? And that, I think, again, I'm not saying that's what you're saying, but there is that notion out there that I push back against. Um, we should talk about San Diego, because uh, I've done a bunch of research around there, the, this idea that the, this idea of handing homework in on time was one of the ways to somehow achieve equity by eliminating that requirement for all 110,000 uh, children in the San Diego school system. Again, I don't think that's a productive way because, that what's that? That backfired. that backfired for everyone, exactly. That's why I talk about it. Um, and, and just you know, real quick on, on the San Diego situation, they did an analysis where they found, I think, something like 20% uh, of black students got a D or an F failing grade, but only 7% of white students did. And, rather than, and so they said that 13 percentage point gap in San Diego, that must be due to racial discrimination. And so rather than say, well, how is it that 80% of black students are succeeding, or 93% of white students are succeeding, or 94% of Asian students are succeeding, is it that they're taking advantage of teacher tutor hours or studying more? They said, no, 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 no. We're going to somehow focus on this 13% uh, 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 gap, and that's where they came with this idea that somehow it's because the, uh, the, the, the stories were that the black students somehow, there wasn't a belief that they could get homework in on time, so let's just remove that requirement for everyone. That is not how we build formative institutions that ask for reciprocity. Imagine a kid that grows up in a school system that feels like homework is an option or whenever I send it in. Is that going to serve them well when they get to college or go to their job assignment? Oh, yeah, boss, I'll, I'll get that to you when I get that to you. you know? um, community schools. I'm mixed on community schools, partially because I think they are attempting to do so much beyond math, reading, and science. Now, there are some interesting models in New York City. You know, Jeffrey Canada was certainly one of the first. I think it's mixed. I think that we need our other institutions, most notably stronger families, stronger faith commitment, um, to play their essential roles because I do think there's a lot of pressure on schools to try and solve a lot of issues that kids are coming up with. I mean, in, I, you know, asthma is one of the biggest issues in the South Bronx that led to um, huge absences. So we created a partnership with asthma organizations that not only help, um, help kids literally um, be able to uh, handle their asthma in emergency situations. We also help represent families to go against their landlords who weren't keeping, you know, but we didn't, we partnered with other institutions. So I get the, the impetus to try and help because there's so many issues that our kids come, up with, come in with, but we can't solve everything. Schools have to play um, their roles. I would love to talk to you more because I feel like you're a kindred spirit. Well, we have time for just one last question. So if anybody here has uh, what they think ought to be our one last question, why don't we uh, go right here in the back. Hey there. Um, my name is Nick Talbert. I'm a student at the University of Alabama. And I have two questions, so I apologize. <laughs> um, but the first is on the lowered expectations you talked about. And I know being in university and being involved in leadership is something I see a lot from the administration. Just in the past year, we've been developing applications for this upcoming school year. And, and I fully agree in, in dropping things such as application fees and stuff like that that may allow low-income students to apply. But we've seen, um, just for personal examples, the dropping of the requirement for ACT or SAT scores for certain applications. Um, we saw the dropping of you know, recommendation letters because they argued minority students can't get recommendations. Um, how do we have these sort of conversations about that when it comes to applications? And then the second question is a lot of what we focused on in the speech has been how to get to individuals to live a good life. But how do we get to certain communities? Being from the South is something I've seen. Um, communities where becoming successful can be seen as abandoning your community or abandoning your family. And getting an education, pursuing a job, um, pursuing that sort of more family life can be seen as it abandoning your roots. How do we address those types of communities? Well, again, in, in our schools, we never send that message. You know, you don't, you, um, you don't have to leave your community in order to make it a better community. I mean, I've written the agency ultimately to reach young people, and maybe there might be a, a, a youth version of the book I write at some point. But in some ways, it's written for 
the layer of leaders who interact with young people on a regular basis? Because you just said a few things. You said we've, re we've removed uh, the need for reference letters because somehow minority students can't get that. Like, where does that even come from as a presumption? Just think about someone's mindset that says, oh, you're black. There's no one in your community that can write you a reference letter, so now I'm going to eliminate that requirement for everyone? That is insidious and, frankly, somewhat kind of racist and discriminatory. And yet, this seems to be the prevailing wisdom that we lower expectations because somehow these victims, remember, they're, you know, they're, they're by virtue of your race or gender, somehow you're either an oppressor or you're an oppressed. And if that's the way of the world, then we just create rules that eliminate any expectation. And that, again, I think is corrosive. I think when you set up systems like that and then kids get in, there is a sense of self-doubt that you did not achieve earned success, that you're not there because of your agency, your talent, because someone else has reduced a set of standards or expectations so that you get in. And I think that's ultimately harmful to kids. Well, that's a good place to end. So thank you very much, Ian Rowe. Thanks to all of you yeah. for being here. Thank uh, you. We appreciate it. Thank you.